Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Tristram Hunt. Question number one, sir. Mr, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister must be heard from the start of the session to the end of the session. The Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I've been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is visiting the United States for meetings with President Obama, making the case for a transatlantic trade agreement between the United States and the European Union, and chairing the high-level panel on development in New York today. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Tristram Hunt. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his answer. If Conservative members of Parliament don't have to support the Government on Europe, why do Liberal Democrat MPs have to support the Government on tripling tuition fees, top-down reorganisation of the NHS, the bedroom tax and all the other wretched policies of this Government? Mr Speaker, Liberal Democrats and indeed Conservatives are working together to clear up the mess left by his party. It is this, it is this government, it is this government that is delivering more apprenticeships than ever before, that is delivering a cap on social care costs, that is delivering a decent state pension for everybody, that is clearing up the mess in the banking system left by that man there and so many people on the benches opposite. Mr. Peter Bone. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, would the Deputy Prime Minister confirm to the House that the only party in this House offering an in out referendum is the Conservative yeah. Party? Mr. Speaker, um, I know he hates to be reminded of things that he and I have actually done together, where we've been on the same side of the argument. But we did actually spend a hundred days in this House, in the early part of this Parliament, passing legislation opposed by the party opposite, which, for the first time ever, gives a guarantee in law about when a referendum on Europe will take place, when the rules next change, when new things are asked to the United Kingdom within the European Union. He and his colleagues in the Conservative Party are perfectly free for their own reasons to change the goalposts. But we have this legislation. The people of Britain have a guarantee when a referendum will take place, and that is what I suggest we should all go out and promote. Yeah. Harriet Harman. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sure everyone's thrilled to see the Deputy Prime Minister, um, and of course myself at the dispatch box today, but this is meant to be Prime Minister's question. Yeah. And once again, the Prime Minister is not here. So can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, why is it that out of the last eight Wednesdays, the Prime Minister has only answered questions in this House once? Mr Speaker, I think the Prime Minister is, is, is unusually assiduous at coming to the House to make statements. And to... I, think, I think the... I think the uh... I think the leader who should be relieved that there isn't Prime Minister's questions is the leader of her party. Ah. I, I am still reeling with dismay that in the, in the, on Radio 4 recently he denied that Boring would go up under Labour's plans ten times. Yes. Who said that there isn't enough comedy on Radio 4? <laughs> We've, we've all seen what the Prime Minister's been doing in America. He's been on a London bus in New York, something we don't actually incidentally see him do, doing a great deal when he's here. Um, he's, also been, he's also been busy explaining to President Obama the benefits of Britain's membership of the European Union. Why is he able to do it in the White House but not in this House? Mr Speaker, uh, to be fair to the Prime Minister, notwithstanding our other differences on this subject, I think he's always made it clear. He's always made it clear that he believes in the continued membership of the European Union, if in a reformed, if in a reformed, uh, in a reformed European Union. Um, 
uh, there, there is a fundamental debate that we need to have in this country about whether we are an open or closed nation, whether we stand tall in our European neighbourhood or not. That is a debate which will continue, and the Prime Minister will continue to make his views known. Harriet Harman. Indeed, it is an important debate, and we've got an important vote on an amendment to the Queen's yeah. speech tonight. Yeah. But the Prime Minister is out of the country. So, can the Deputy Prime Minister, can the Deputy Prime Minister help the House? If the Prime Minister was here today, would he be voting for the government, against the government, or showing true leadership and abstaining? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, the honourable lady, right honourable lady, spent three questions pointing out the prime minister is not here. Um, it's a striking observation, a penetrating insight into uh, uh, the affairs of state uh, today. Uh, look. She rejected, her party rejected, an opportunity just two years ago to vote on legislation, which we on this side of the House uh, uh, pushed through, to giving the British people for the first time a copper bottom uh, legal guarantee about when a refer referendum would take place. Our position is perfectly clear, hers is not. Harriet Harman. This is an extraordinary situation. The Deputy Prime Minister has not told the House how the Prime Minister would have been voting if he was here. Is it that he doesn't know? Or is it that he doesn't want to tell the House? Or because he thinks probably the Prime Minister would have changed his mind by the time we would have been told? But while the Prime Minister is bogged down in confusion about Europe, people are suffering. Today's figures show unemployment is up, more people out of work, and those out of work for more than two years at its highest since 1997. So what's today's excuse? Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, um, she comments on, on, on today's um, figures, and of course any, anyone who is without work, um, it, that's an individual a tragedy, and must always work to bring unemployment down. But I think, I, think she is, I think she's giving the House a somewhat sort of partial snapshot. Full-time full -time employment is actually up 10,000 this quarter. Uh, there are more people in the private sector employed than ever before. Employment is up 866 thousand since the election and the number of women employed is at the highest level it has ever been isn't that something that she should celebrate rather than denigrate one will see complete complacency while things are getting worse and the fact is that even those who are in work are worse off wages are falling behind prices and the IFS shows that as a result of all his changes families on lower and middle incomes are worse off will he own up to that will he admit it Mr. Speaker, complacency this from the party that crashed the British economy on a prawn cocktail charm offensive, sucking up to the banks, which led to the disaster in the banking system in the first place, that had a banking, that had a tax system in which a cleaner would pay more on her wages, on his or her wages, than the hedge fund manager would on their shares. Under this government, the richest are paying more every year in taxes than they did under Labour. Under this government, under this government, 24 million basic rate taxpayers will be £700 better off next year than they were under Labour. Under this government, as of next April, almost 3 million people on low pay will be taken out of paying any income tax altogether. How about that for a record to be proud of? So he votes for a tax cut for millionaires and then comes to the House and says the rich will be paying more. Three years into this coalition, everyone knows the country faces big problems. Yes. And what do we have? We have a Prime Minister who's not just indecisive, not just weak, but fast becoming a laughing stock. She mentions, as, as members of the Labour Party do often, the upper rate of income tax. Uh, under us, it is 45p. Um, 40 p. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a great enthusiast. What was the rate? What was the rate under Labour? What was it for 13 years? Was it 50p? No. Was it 45p? No. The Labour rate was 40p. The richest of in this country off the hook, we didn't. Yeah. Sir Roger Gale. Mr. Speaker, given the Liberal Democrats' commitment to a, a European Union referendum, would uh, my right honourable friend see fit to help to facilitate? 
time, government time for a private member's bill on the subject, should that become available? Yeah. Mr Speaker, um, as, uh, as he knows, my party has always believed there should be a referendum on uh, Europe uh, when the rules change, when there's, uh, new things are being asked of the United Kingdom within the European Union. That's what we had in our last manifesto, and that's what we've now acted on in government by passing legislation together in the coalition just two years ago, giving an absolute legal guarantee in legislation for the first time ever that when the rules change, there will be a referendum. And by the way, I think it's a question of when, not if, because the rules are bound to change. And I would just simply suggest that we should stick to what we've done as a government in giving that guarantee to the British people, rather than constantly shifting the goalposts. Mr Robert Flello. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Perhaps the Deputy Prime Minister shares my dismay at allegations of price fixing in the oil market. <coughs> Will he explain why he has consistently opposed amendments tabled by this side of the House for proper regulation of oil and commodity prices by the Financial Conduct Authority? Will he now accept that he was wrong? accept the amendments from this side and get petrol prices and diesel prices at the pump reduced. Speaker, yet another example of astonishing amnesia. <laughs> what happened for 13 years? What happened for 13 years? Did he or any of the members of the front bench do anything? Did he do anything? The, the, investigation, the investigation into alleged vote rigging, and by the way, I think it's very important that the oil companies concerned should, of course, cooperate uh, with a European Union institution which is doing very good work on behalf of British uh, consumers, stretches right back into the years in which Labour in power. What on earth did they do? Once again, asleep at the wheel. Margot James. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm sure the Deputy Prime Minister shares the widespread revulsion against the perpetrators of the crimes against the young and vulnerable girls in Oxford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does he agree that we now look to the courts to impose the severest possible penalties against these evil men so that those poor girls can get the justice they were denied by the police and the local authority? Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure my, my honourable friend speaks um, on behalf of everybody in this House. Not, not only it's uh, the sense of revulsion at these truly uh, evil acts, but also, actually, I, I think we should pay tribute to the courage of these young women, uh, who've, who, you know, whose, whose childhood, whose, the innocence of their childhood, was so uh, horridly destroyed by this uh, evil gang, and the courage that must have taken to come forward and give evidence is something which I think we should all pay tribute towards. And I certainly agree with her that, of course, lessons should be learned about, particularly, how the police forces and social, um, uh, social uh, um, uh, services work together, but also that they are handed down the severest possible sentences in response to this very reprehensible crime. Toby Perkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister talks about the individual tragedy of unemployment, but a year ago this government made thousands of employee workers that were disabled unemployed. 69% of them are still unemployed. They wanted to work, but it's costing the government more to keep them on the dole. Doesn't this show that the government isn't just heartless, but utterly incompetent? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as I, as I hope he knows, the, the approach we've taken to Remploy was um, in response to uh, independent recommendations made by senior figures who are active in the area of um, uh, um, disabilities and the rights of those with disabilities. And the recommendation that came through was very, very clear that it is simply not right to say to people with disabilities that somehow they should be hidden away and put in a separate, in a separate silo. We should do what we can to give them support to be part of the mainstream labour market along with everybody else. And that is why we haven't in any way cut the support for those workers in Remploy factories as they make the transition from those factories into the world of mainstream work. Andrew Turner. Doesn't the Deputy Prime Minister recall that at the last election he promised to go for an in-out referendum? That hasn't taken place yet. Would he understand that residents of the Isle of Wight and many from elsewhere would feel betrayed if the Liberal Democrats did not now support an amendment regretting that the referendum is not included in the gracious speech? Mr Speaker, as he, as he knows, our commitment was for a referendum when, the, when there's a fundamental change in the relationship. Yes, it, well, read our manifesto. I have. I helped write it. I can guarantee you that's what it says. And we've acted on that. But just on the look, I have an old, I have an old-fashioned view. I have an old. Oh, 
wonder. I don't think that the Deputy Prime Minister particularly minds being shouted at, but I don't want him to be excessively shouted at. I think the House should hear his answer, and certainly the people of the Isle of Wight should hear his answer. The Deputy Prime Minister. Kind of you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Um, Look, I have an old-fashioned view that when a government puts forward a Queen's Queen's Speech, which has got a lot of good things in it, a cap on social care costs, a a decent single-tier pension for everybody, a cut in national insurance contributions for employers to create jobs, we on this side of the House should go out and promote what's in the Queen's Speech, not spend days bemoaning what's not in the Queen's Speech. The Reverend William McRae. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The police in Northern Ireland have stated that if the crime or the National Crime Agency is unable to operate fully in Northern Ireland, it would have a detrimental impact on their ability to keep the people of Northern Ireland safe or combat serious and organised crime. Surely no political party in Northern Ireland has a right to gamble with the safety of Northern Ireland people. What action, therefore, does the government propose to take to ensure that no one is able to hold the people of Northern Ireland to ransom and make Northern Ireland an easy target for international crime? Mr Speaker, I'm I'm sure everyone shares um, my instinct that, um, as with all sensitive issues in Northern Ireland, the more that um, we can talk across parties, across um, Uh, traditional divides and hostilities, the more that we promote the prosperity and indeed the security of the people of Northern Ireland and of the people of the United Kingdom as a whole. Mr Alan Reid. This government has helped motorists in their island butte by cutting fuel duty by 13 pence on the mainland, 18 pence on the island compared to Labour's disastrous plans. Now that the European authorities are investigating the oil companies, will the government make sure that oil companies here obey the rules, end any fix- price fixing that may be going on? It's important that the government's good policy and fuel duty means that the benefit ends up in the pockets of the motorists, not the oil companies. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm, great, I'm grateful to him for reminding the House that um, the prices of, uh, of fuel in the forecourt would be 13 pence higher. Uh, under the plans embarked upon by the party opposite. They, they hate to hear this, to be reminded of it, but I'm afraid it's true. Uh, it would be 13 pence uh, higher, which would be crippling, a crippling additional cost of living for millions of people in this country. And I agree with him that the large oil companies that are now under investigation for these allegations should, of course, fully cooperate with the European Commission. Yeah. Jim McGovern. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, can I put a question to the Deputy Prime Minister, which may go against the grain for me? I, I have been vociferous in my support of the Remploy organisation, and unfortunately, the Remploy factory in my constituency is earmarked for closure. The, the members of the workforce received letters in March advising them to seek alternative employment. Some of them have done so successfully, but on Monday, they were given an interview and told that they would not be allowed to leave employment with Remploy, and if they insisted on doing so, they would not receive the severance package offered to every other member of the month. Can the Deputy Prime Minister look into, look into this? Yeah, very good. Very good. Of course, I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for uh, Work and Pensions, will look into the uh, specific issues he raises. As I, as I said in uh, in reference to the, in response to the earlier question. The, 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 the thinking behind this is, is of course, uh, to ensure that those who work in Remploy factories do find gainful employment in mainstream, in mainstream work. That is the recommendation that came from, not the government, but from independent observers who said this is the best way to make sure that we don't ghettoise those with disabilities in the labour market, and that's what we'll continue to work towards. Stuart. Mr Speaker, millions of people are struggling with their electricity bills, and our electricity infrastructure is creaking. We have a solution in Wigton where we're developing a smart grid which will make our electricity more reliable and more affordable. Would the Deputy Prime Minister commit to visiting Wigton and make the bold investment to roll a true smart grid out across the country? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'd, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to convey my congratulations to him and indeed everybody in Wigton who have uh, launched this smart energy pilot uh, project, and I'm delighted to hear that it's elicited so much enthusiasm from the local community. It really is, as he says, the first step towards creating a smart energy community. I know that uh, officials from the Department for Energy and Climate Change have met the pilot's network provider to discuss its benefits, and if it works, I think it's exactly the kind of thing that we should indeed uh, seek to try uh, and extend to other parts of the country. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. On earlier questions, 
The Deputy Prime Minister blamed everybody but himself and his government on the whole question of price fixing with uh, fuel prices. I am old enough to remember a thing called the Price Commission, where the price of petrol and other commodities was the same across the whole land. ASDA are able to do that, but the oil companies are price fixing in my constituency and elsewhere. Also, this government has introduced an increase in the VAT and fuel, which has led to three pains. What's he going to do about all that? As as I said, we we have actually scrapped the uh, fuel uh, price hikes, which were planned and decided upon by the previous government. But of course, of course, allegations of uh, price manipulation are incredibly serious. I'm pleased that the European Commission is taking this as seriously uh, as they are. And I think it is very important on on all of our behalves, and certainly on the behalves of all of our constituents, for whom uh, price, uh, petrol and diesel and fuel prices are an incredibly important important part of the, the weekly and monthly uh, household budget, that those companies now engage seriously in looking at the allegations put to them by the European Commission. Yeah. Mr Edward Lee. I have here a, a leaflet issued by the Liberal Democrats at the time, <laughs> at the time of the passage of the, Lib, uh, of the Lisbon Treaty. On the front page is a man opposing as one Nick Clegg, who says it's time for a real referendum on Europe an in-out referendum, not a referendum on a treaty change. Was that man an imposter or just a hypocrite? (laughs) Mr Speaker... um, That that man, who I believe to be uh, me, um, was, was stating something then which, which my party has restated ever since, which is that we should have a referendum on Europe when the rules change. We said that, we said that, we said that, we said that at the time, we said that at the time of the Lisbon Treaty, and we said it in our manifesto. We have legislated on it, and we will say it again. <laughs> Mr Gray, I was thinking of calling you to ask a question, but if you continue to misbehave, I might not. (laughs) Um, Mr Ian Murray. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me, the late Baroness Thatcher, senior government members on the Biz Select Committee, the Liberal Democrat Manifesto, the Minister in charge of the Royal Mail and his own government, and indeed, does he still agree with himself that the privatisation of the Royal Mail is a step too far? Yeah. So I, actually think, I actually think we should um, uh, welcome the innovative way in which we are seeking to give workers in uh, Royal Mail a stake in that company. Uh, you know, worker ownership used to be something that his party believed in. But as with so many other issues, the Labour Party is still a blank sheet of paper when it comes to public policy of any significance whatsoever. This side of the House is moving forward. They're standing still. Mr Simon Hughes. Mr Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have to tell my friend that I can't that I can't support the decision of the Prime Minister to go to the Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference in Sri Lanka because of the human rights record of the Sri Lankan Government. What can the Deputy Prime Minister tell us as to how we can respond to that terrible regime's record and what can we do to make sure the Commonwealth in future doesn't just say it believes in human rights but does something about it? Mr. Mr. Speaker, of of course I'm aware, we're all aware that the decision um, that the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary will attend the upcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Sri Lanka is controversial, especially in light of the despicable human rights violations that have taken place during the recent civil war. But I can assure him, I can assure him that of course the government condemns those violations uh, and that the way in which political trials, regular assaults on legal professionals, the suppression of press freedom continue and that too many recommendations of the Lesson Learnt and Reconciliation Commission have not been implemented. And if such violations continue and if the Sri Lankan government continues to ignore its international commitments in the lead-up to the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, of course there will be consequences. Ellen Jones. When the Deputy Prime Minister spoke about youth unemployment in 2011, he said, the Coalition will not sit on our hands and allow a whole generation to fall behind. 
Now that we know long-term youth unemployment has trebled under this government, why is he sitting on his hands and refusing to match our jobs guarantee? Is it because he has no influence in government or because he doesn't care? Mr Speaker, on the day in which youth unemployment actually declined, in view of the fact that youth unemployment, in view of the fact that youth unemployment went up remorselessly year after year after year in the latter half of the Labour government's uh, administration, given that we, on this side of the House, are introducing a £1 billion youth contract, which gives everyone between the ages of 18 to 24 who has been out of work for a certain period of time the opportunity to take up an apprenticeship or subsidised work or a place on work experience. I think it is pretty rich coming from her that she seeks to lecture us about the problems of youth unemployment. Mr Nigel Adams. Yeah. Has the Deputy Prime Minister had time to reflect on this week's analysis of Yorkshire's top 150 companies by the accountancy firm BDO, which has shown that in Yorkshire, businesses over the last year have seen an increase of revenues of £5 billion, investment up 20%, exports from Yorkshire to emerging markets up 50%, and that 10,000 new jobs have been created in the last year by Yorkshire firms? Speaker, uh, uh, as, a, as, as an MP from a great Yorkshire city, I of course want to join him in celebrating the great achievements of businesses in Yorkshire, and particularly, particularly the rebirth of so many great manufacturing companies uh, in Yorkshire. And the fact that we, on this side of the House, have been ba backing manufacturing after years of neglect under Labour is something I'm immensely proud of. Even Hepburn. The government's much-trumpeted mesothelioma bill was introduced last week, but in actual fact the only people who are going to be compensated are those people who were diagnosed after July the 25th, 2012. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that it's wrong and unfair that those leeches in the insurance industry who are bankrolling the Tory party are getting away with millions and millions when working class people who have been negligently poisoned by their employers are getting away with nothing. I would like to ask him what, what, does, he, what does he think happened for 13 years under Labour in, in that case? And Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm hugely sympathetic, I'm sure everybody is, to the plight of people who are unable to trace a liable employer or insurer against whom they can bring a claim. We announced, we did announce our intention to bring forward legislation to introduce the scheme on the 25th of July 2012. And it is from that date that people uh, have a, had a reasonable expectation that if they're diagnosed with asbestos-related cancer, that after that date, and they meet the eligibility criteria, they will receive a payment. But because we've also decided to pay dependents of people who've, di who've, dis who've died with uh, that cancer, the scheme will not be able to pay dependents of every person uh, who has died. And that is the reason we've taken the approach that we have. Mr James Gray. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister is a great Democrat as well as a Liberal, and I salute him for that. And will you therefore stand by the precise wording in this very fetching Liberal Democrat leaflet, which I happen to have found on my desk this morning, where it says, only a real referendum on British membership of the EU will let the people decide our country's future. Will you now stand by that solemn pledge to the people of Britain and join us in the lobbies tonight? Mr. Peter Speaker, I fully stand behind the position I took then, and my party's taken ever since, that when there is a change in the rules and new things are asked of the United Kingdom within the European Union, there should and there will be a referendum. Not only that, we've done better than uh, since the time we issued that leaf in 2008. We've legislated to guarantee that to the British people for the first time in primary legislation just two years ago. We spent a hundred days debating that in this House at the time. If he wants to reinvent it all over again and keep picking away at this issue, what will he give up from a fairly crowded uh, Queen's speech? Will he tell his constituents we won't put a cap on social care costs, we won't deliver a single tier pension, we won't pass legislation to have a national insurance contribution cut for employers? I think we should stick to the priorities of the British people, which is growth and jobs. Naomi Long. Three of my young constituents, Emma Carson, Emma McGowan and Sophie Ebbinghouse, recently handed over to me posters they'd made supporting the F campaign. And they asked me to tell the Prime Minister of their concerns for boys and girls growing up without enough food to survive. Unfortunately, he isn't here. But what assurances can the Deputy Prime Minister give them 
that the forthcoming G8 summit in Northern Ireland will deliver real action to ensure that there really is enough food for everyone. Mr. Speaker, I am I'm a huge supporter, as she is, and I think many people are on all sides of the House uh, of the uh, of the IF uh, campaign. And I attended, like many members did, honourable members did, the launch here in uh, in, in Westminster. It is a, you know, it, of course, it's a, just a total scandal. And in 2013, there are nearly a billion people globally who are hungry or malnourished. And I'm delighted about the cooperation between all the different campaign groups in the IF campaign and this government in pushing forward a radical agenda, which has never really been tried before in the G8 under our presidency, to make sure that there is tax fairness, that there is uh, proper transparency in the way in which resources, uh, primary resources are exploited in the developing world, and in which, of course, trade works for uh, the poorest um, around the planet. And that's why we do work hand in hand with the IF campaign in our G8 presidency. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2008, the Independent Reconfiguration Panel made a series of recommendations in response to an attempt by my local NHS Trust to downgrade maternity at Eastbourne DGH. These IRP recommendations were, in my view, in the view of eminent local clinicians, never properly introduced, which has now led to safety issues that perversely have enabled the Trust to implement the service changes which were originally rejected by the IRP. Will the Deputy Prime Minister look to address this anomaly and ensure hospitals actually do implement IRP recommendations robustly and that this is audited, including at my own hospital, the Eastbourne DGA? Well, we escape for a German debate on the back of it. Let's have a brief answer. Thank you, Mr Speaker, I'd li- I obviously like to pay... Pay tribute to my, um, uh, my honourable friend for all the work he does on behalf of his local community um, in relation to his local hospital. My understanding is that the changes to maternity services at Hastings Hospital are temporary and no permanent changes will, of course, be made without full public consultation. He makes an important point uh, about the role of the independent reconfiguration uh, panel, and um, I, will, I will ask uh, the, the Secretary of State for Health to discuss this matter with him further. Paul McDonough. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In answer to his uh, honourable friend's question about Sri Lanka, the Deputy Prime Minister gave us a long list of the atrocities committed by the Sri Lankan Government. Why, then, is his Government going to the Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit in Sri Lanka? Why are they announcing it six months ahead of time? And why do they want to see an alleged war criminal as the chair of the Commonwealth? Speaker, I, I, I think all, all of us uh, accept the controversy around this, accept the unease around this. But you know, um, we, what we will be doing, what we will be doing by attending the Commonwealth Heads of uh, Government meeting in Sri Lanka, is using the opportunity to cast a spotlight on the unacceptable abuses in Sri Lanka. As I said earlier, as I said earlier, of course there will be consequences if there is not a change in the conduct of the Sri Lankan authorities. And the Commonwealth matters to us all. The Commonwealth is based on a number of values where I accept, I think, our implicit criticism is that all Commonwealth governments should do more not just to talk about those values, but to make sure that they're properly monitored and enforced. Seaton Harris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Special Olympic Movement showcases the abilities and achievements of learning disabled athletes across the world whilst delivering pos- positive inclusion, education, and health outcomes. The British Games, Special Olympic Games, take place in Bath this summer. Could the Deputy Prime Minister assure me that the government is doing all it can to spread the legacy from last year's Olympics across all disability sports, including these Special Olympic Games? Yes, Mr Speaker, I think I can, I think I can give my honourable friend <coughs> that assurance. The, um, as he knows, last summer my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, appointed Lord Coe to be his legacy ambassador. There's also a Paralympic Legacy Advisory Group which has been um, established. And I know that Lord Coe's team is meeting Special Olympics G- uh, GB shortly to discuss the potential links between the legacy from London 2012 and the National Summer Games, which will, as he he said, uh, be held in Bath later this summer.